to us that we need. And Lord, we come into your house today with a voice of praise, lifting up and exalting your name, for you are worthy to be praised from the time we wake in the morning to the time we sleep at night. You will be praised all the day long. We praise you and exalt you in Jesus' name. Bless the services today, the teaching that your anointing would be upon us afresh. Touch every heart today. And most of all, draw us near to you, Lord. Let us feel your touch, your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord. God is great. Amen. Amen. You may be seated all the time. That's right. So we're going to go right into the, uh, to the harbinger. We're going to continue the lesson today. As we said last week, we're going to study the mystery of the Shemitah. And this is going to be really interesting for some of us. This has a big part in, in how God deals with the nation, some provisions that he's made. And I'm not going to go and recap uh, all of the ground that we've covered to date, talking about the harbinger, but just suffice it to say, we've covered all the nine harbingers in part one. And then last week, we talked about the significance of the sycamore tree, the uprooting, uh, symbolizing the uprooting of a nation, a nation's foundation being exposed during a time of calamity. And uh, we, we find now that there is more to the story than just ending with calamity or God's harbingers warning America, warning a people uh, of pending judgment unless we return to God, a call for us to return and repent and be reconciled unto him. And God has dealt this way with his people all through time. We find ancient Israel, God drawing on them, pulling them back towards him, and then we see a defiance as Israel said, we're not going to go back to God, but we're going to do things our way. We're going to be strong and have resolve and resilient uh, to, to fortify and, and, and rebuild, and we see God's dealing with them. He continues to deal with them, so this is a continuation of part two, which is the Isaiah 9:10 effect, which there is a second shaking. The first shaking was a calamity that happened on ancient Israel when the Assyrians came in and attacked and just amazed them that there would be such an attack. But then what happened was because they defied God and they, they uh, did not follow him and come back to him and repent, God did not stop at the end of that first calamity, but he continued to pull upon them and impress upon them their need to come back to God. So there was a second shaking. There came a second. And that's what we know as the Isaiah 9:10 effect. And so as we study this, again, last week we touched on the uh, uprooted. Today we're going to talk about the mystery of the Shemitah, which is really exciting when you start to look at what God had provided for his people and then the impact of the Shemitah on a people who has departed from God because the Shemitah remains in effect regardless of whether the people are with God or not with God. It still continues. So what happens when a nation that once knew God and his rest drives him out of its life what happens when a believer <clears throat> does the same? So as we've looked at this series of lessons, we understand this is God dealing with the nation, but also God is consistent. It's the same way that he deals with an individual, an individual that once knew God, that had a relationship and walk with God, and then that individual starts to depart away and slip away, slide away from God's presence and going back into the world, doing their own thing. There is a, a, a point in time that that individual will come in contact with the presence of God again, and God will begin drawing them back to himself because they once knew him. And that's the love of God that does that. God doesn't do it out of meanness or any kind of malicious intent upon a people. God's not lording over people, but God knows what is provided for people, and the people come in contact with the salvation and deliverance of God, but then they begin to walk away from it, and that's a tragedy. So God, in his mercy and his grace and his love will start drawing on them again, bringing them back to himself. And that's what we find God doing with ancient Israel. He's doing it, he's doing it again on American soil. He's reaching into America, having founded and, and been established on the word of God. And America, as we all know, has departed from godly values. As a country, as a society, as a culture, we have drifted far from God. We have removed God from our public square. We've removed him from our schoolrooms, our courthouses, our hospitals. God has been removed. And the interesting thing that, that we've seen uh, as we, before we go into the Shemitah is we see the, the, the horrible situation this week in Boston. And, and, and it, it absolutely was devastating to see some of the pictures and the footage on what happened there. And I think shockwaves went throughout all of this country uh, as a result of that and the, the, the sorrow of what would happen and what would, what would 
be in a person's mind to do such a thing and look eye to eye with people that they know just in a few minutes are going to uh, have horrible things come upon them and just the whole thing that goes with that. But a couple days later, uh, after the, the, the shock of it started to die down, I heard on a couple of news commentators as they were talking to different uh, they had, I, I believe it was a rabbi and a, a priest that was being interviewed, and they said, uh, people were asking the question, what kind of God would allow this to happen? And where is God when something like this happens? And, you know, in the, that is kind of a, a human response to calamity, that many times we don't understand why things happen the way that they do. And... I was so impressed when I heard the question posed like that. What kind of God would let things happen? Where was God when this happened? And then I began to remember everything that we're going over in the study of the Harbingers and how far America has departed from God. That America as a culture really could care less about God until devastation happened. Then they turn it all around as though they want to blame God for allowing this to happen. When we as a people have removed God and how convenient it is to pass the buck to God and to begin to blame God for situations. And I, I think that there are times that, yes, Good th or bad things happen to good people. We see that throughout history. But there are also many cases where a people will move so far away from God and then to have the, the fortitude to say, where was God when this happened to me? Why would he allow this? When I have been living so wretchedly and, and completely disregarding God's principles in my life, why would it be a surprise to me if I have all kinds of trouble in this world if I am living so far away from godly values and principles? Why would I expect the principles of God's deliverance to work in my life if I'm not following his principles anywhere else in my life? That's not even logical. So it's important for us to keep our walk with God as close as we can to him. That's, that's the message. And, and so... When we are close to God and bad things happen, we have a peace through that storm. But when we're not close to God and bad things happen and the storm comes up, we're devastated. There's no peace because we're completely exposed and vulnerable, and we know that. So there's a complete different uh, approach to it. So I thought I'd bring that up, and that, that's really playing through today the harbingers and this pressure, this oppression, this uh, uh, mode of attack that's on on our country and really drawing us back to him. So let's look at the Shemitah. The Shemitah is the seventh year. It's everything to do with the seventh year uh, in ancient Israel. God provided in the Old Testament plan as he gave Moses all of the law and the commandments and, and everything that would happen in the ordinances and provisions and how he expected Israel to follow him and do the things that he had outlined for them. And in response to that, God would do certain things from him. It was a contract. And so we see that Israel would follow different things about uh, the Sabbath and the Shemitah, the Sabbath being the seventh day, the Shemitah being the seventh year. So God commanded that every seven years the people were to rest. And we know he also commanded on the seventh day the people were to rest. But the Shemitah all focuses around the seventh year. So it was a Sabbath year, it was a Shemitah. Israel's obedience to the Shemitah command revealed their relationship with God. So the Regardless of how close Israel was with God or how far they had moved away from God, the Shemitah would still apply in their situation, but it would have a different complexion if they were close to God and it would provide rest, or if they were far from God, the Shemitah would still happen on the seventh year, but it would become more calamity to their situation. It would, it would expand on the, the disaster and, and the destruction on the people as the Shemitah effect would run uh, very strongly through the, the children of Israel. So regardless of whether they were close to God or not, the Shemitah would still happen, but it would just depend on their relationship with him, whether they were in obedience to God's word or defiance to God's word is what the Shemitah would look like. So let's take a, a deeper look into it. Leviticus 25, cha uh, chapter 25, verse 2 through 4 says it like this. 
Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. In verse 4, But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. So this is the way God constructed or set up the Shemitah. Every seventh year, you rest. You don't touch that vineyard. You don't do anything with your fields. You just let them go. In the uh, first six years, you provide or you store up what's needed for that seventh year because you're going to rest. So God commanded the seventh Sabbath day, the seventh day for rest. He also commanded the Shemitah year of rest, which is the seventh year. So this Shemitah represented three things. It was referred to in many uh, cases as the release. This would be a time of release if I, not only my fields or my vineyards and what I'm doing in my occupation that I need to rest from, but there's also a release of debts that I may owe. There's a release of um, accountability that I may have in certain situations. There's a remission. There's like a, a letting go of the strings that were attached to me or the bondage I may have been in or the, uh, the uh, debt that I had to repay. So it was referred to as a release, the remission, or the letting rest. So Exodus 23 begins to explain a little bit more. It says, the six years, uh, the six years thou shalt sow thy land and shalt gather in the fruits thereof, but the seventh year that you shall let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat, and what they leave the beast of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with the olive yard. So here we have a time of rest where if you owned a, a large farm or vineyard and you worked in it for seven years, now that or six years, that seventh year you would leave it alone and you wouldn't even tend to it. You wouldn't even go there. And by not being there, it would allow the people that uh, were of lesser means to come in freely into your vineyard and partake of the produce that came out of your field. So it was not only a time of rest for you and your family, but it would also be a time of rest for you if you did not have a vineyard and you needed supplies. Because now that seventh year, you would be able to go get what you need to provide for your family. So it was, it was a balancing, if you will, or a time of, of truly distributing and, and preparing for all of the people of God. So that's, that's what we see as we expand on the learning of Shemitah. As we go a little further, every seventh year, God required the opening up of a land. He provided for those in need. The poor would share with the rich. So this didn't only refer to the land, it also referred to finances. It says in Deuteronomy 15, 1, 1 and 2, it says, At the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that hath ought unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. Pretty amazing when you think about the Shemitah. So, here, so you see the picture now fully. You see... The fields are opened up on the seventh year. The vineyards are opened up. The orange groves are opened up. The, the corn rows, you can go get all the corn you need, all the green beans you need, all the cabbage you need. Whatever it is, you can go get it. And if you owe anyone anything, that's, you're going to be released. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? How many would like a Shemitah right now? <laughs> I could do for a Shemitah about now. That would be pretty cool. Uh. Unfortunately, we're, <laughs> we don't have that now. But this was an amazing environment that these folks lived in. So this is, this is teaching them the fact that God is in control of them. That they don't need to be so self-centered and involve themselves in such stockpiling and and fear that they would be without because God always made a way. And God was their provider. God was their deliverer. We see this all through the, the years in the wilderness. God always provided for them. And many times they would complain and they would 
They would, you know, all the frustrations that would go along with that, and we know all that. But it was always a message of, I am your God, I am your provider. Now, when you get to the point where you think you can provide for yourselves better than I can provide for you, well, guess what? The Shemitah is also going to be at play, and it's going to force you to do some things you don't want to do because now you want to hold on to those debts that people owe you. You want to hold on to those loans, and you still want to collect it. You still want to bring it in. And you don't want anybody to go into your, your yards or your backyard or your vineyard or touch your cattle or anything like that, you, you want to keep it all to yourself and you want them to pay you for all of this. And this is what happens as they begin to depart from God and they begin to take in the other cultures and civilizations, their way of exchange and commerce because now they start to look more like the world rather than like God's people. But yet the Shemitah would still come upon them and this is where it changes. If your position with God is obedience, God provides he, he takes care of everything. If your position is disobedience and obstinance and defiance, then God's still going to require it, but it's going to be a painful extraction. Very different approaches, but the Shemitah effect still rules. It still goes forward. So we're going to find something that happens in America that's very similar. So in the seventh year, it would happen every seventh year, and it would begin, actually, that Shemitah year would begin on the 29th day of biblical Elul. So Elul is on the Hebrew calendar, and I put a picture of the calendar in the red circle, and I know you probably can't see that very well. The red circle is what our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, is January, February, all the way through December. And then you see how it overlays against the Hebrew calendar. So where you have... goes back and forth like that. So the significance of understanding the 29th day of biblical Elul, that would trigger the Shemitah. All debts at that point would be canceled. A nation's financial accounts would be nullified. So God would just take care of everything. He would wipe the slate completely clean. And it would be a fresh start for everybody. The effects of the Shemitah would, in, a, in an essence, would be diminishing all of these oppressions that would be upon the people, all of these burdens that they would carry. So there would be a financial realm that the Shemitah would impact. There would be an economic realm that it would impact. There would be a labor force realm that it would impact because now you don't need all the laborers in the vineyard. You don't need all the people to take care of the harvest because it's taking care of itself. So it touches that. The employment and production and consumption and trade, it all changes on the Shemitah, the seventh year, because there's not a need to have that kind of, of driving production in the nation because it's a year of rest. Everything's touched. Nothing remains untouched through the Shemitah. So you see, as the economy would look like a, 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 a huge uh, de-emphasis around the economy of Israel, and for some purposes you would look at it and say the economy has just stopped altogether for one whole year, a seventh year. Just forget it. There's... Economy doesn't even play. Now, we can't even hardly relate to that. But the amazing thing is, what would a Shemitah look like in America? It would kind of look like a national economic collapse. When, so now that we've described everything about the Shemitah, that's really what it is. It's a collapse. From the outside in, you're looking at it and thinking, wow, you've got the Amalekites and the Philistines and the Amorites and Jebusites and the termites and everybody else. And they're all looking at Israel like, what are you guys doing? You've just stopped everything. You're just gone. You're, you, you guys are just laying around fat, dumb, and happy for a whole year while we're out here still working. And it looks like a collapse, like everything's done for a whole year. Well, that is what it looked like. But if we look at America, 
If we put a Shemitah in America, it would look like everything stops. It shuts down. Well, would you say around the events of 9-11 and the years that followed, we pretty much have experienced a Shemitah? So we're going to break it down, and you're going to see how what we really did experience and how amazingly similar it is to the biblical Shemitah that we have experienced in this country. So here you have this guy jumping for joy. Why? It's the, the intent of the Shemitah is wonderful. If you're living for God, if you're uh, following his word and practicing his law, you're released from debt. That's a wonderful thing. That's the intent of Shemitah. You have freedom, financial freedom. You have work freedom. You don't have to go, go to work on the seventh year. It's wonderful. Rest from labor. I, I mean, we had a showing of hands a minute ago. Everybody would like a year off, a one-year vacation. I would sign up for that. And my boss would look at me like, yeah, you can have one-year vacation. You can have longer than that. You can have retirement right now if you want to, buddy. So it was a time of drawing near to God. That's the intent of Shemitah. The intent of Shemitah was not to impose some kind of ridiculous uh, ordinance upon the people that was burdensome and onerous. The purpose of this was this is a time of clearing your mind and really drawing back close to God, getting to know God, and you don't have all the busyness of the day. How many times, Brother Sebio, have you said, I just wish I didn't have to do any of this stuff in the, in the secular world that I could just study? You've said that a lot. What you're saying is, I wish I had a Shemitah. That's exactly what you're saying. Because it's a time of reunion with God. It's a time of appreciating and a time of thanksgiving to God for all of his goodness, all of his blessing, all of his provision, the way God is and the way he loves his people. A Shemitah is a wonderful thing. That's what the intent of Shemitah was. But if someone is not close to God or a nation is departed from God, what does it look like? There's someone that would have abandoned the Sabbath. They don't on the seventh day any longer uh, rest because now they're too busy working. They're too busy collecting their taxes, collecting their debts, and lording over people. And they are ignoring the, the Shemitah. The seventh year, they're continuing to work. They're doing what all the other nations were doing. They removed God from their daily life. This is a country that is not observing Shemitah, and they're not observing, observing God's way. They're driving God away from their fields of labor, from their government and their culture, from their home and their personal life, from their culture and religious life. This is what a nation looks like when she's departed from God. But the Shemitah, as we said at the opening, the Shemitah still does have an impact. Whether we're close to God or not, the Shemitah does still play in, the, in God's relationship with his people. So what was once intended as a blessing, Shemitah as a blessing, now becomes Shemitah as a judgment. Because it becomes actually very harsh. It actually imposes national calamity. It does cause the land to be released that was once at rest. And Shemitah now is no longer at rest but it's in calamity, it's at peril. Ravaged cities and fields is what we would find ancient Israel as no longer observing God's Shemitah, but the Shemitah is still having its way in their, in their culture, and their system. They would find ravaged cities and fields where once the Shemitah would be a time of rest and relaxation in God's presence. Now the people that should be resting were actually a captured people, a captive people. They were once liberated by the Shemitah, and now they're no longer free, but they're captive as a result of the impact of Shemitah. So the land that once rested and commerce would stop for a peace and a blessing now becomes a land arrested and a land that everything has stopped and there's no production, but not because of God's blessing upon it, but because of the judgment that has come upon them and that's been taken from them. Accounts and debts were wiped away as they would be taken out of their homes, out of their lives, away from their families, and put in jail cells where accounts didn't mean anything anymore. They sure were wiped away, but not in a way they wanted them to be wiped away. They were prisoners. That's what happened to the children of Israel. So let's look at America's Shemitah. America, that is known as one nation under God, right? America that is built on biblical values. America where our forefathers would stand and create a, a, um, a declaration of independence. And from the very beginning, even the Mayflower Compact that would, uh, that would actually outline the reason why 
We are becoming independent from Britain. Why we wanted to come here and establish our own union so that we could follow God out of the convictions of our heart and that we could follow and reach out to him freely. That's why America was founded. But now we find a country that's not like that anymore. We find a country that's uh, no longer required to observe Shemitah, but we still do have an Israel connection. As we were founded on God's word, we're dedicated to God's will. We're blessed by God, but we've departed from God. And now God is calling us back. But we're now a country full of idols, just like ancient Israel was. The Shemitah has appeared on American soil, not as a blessing, but actually as a sign of national judgment. And the reason why it's been reactivated or activated on our soil is because of the harbingers that manifested themselves in America were the exact same nine harbingers that manifested themselves in ancient Israel. And we see as leaders of our, of our government have stood and enacted the same vow of defiance against, against this world and against God, the same vow that was spoken by... And, and represented by Isaiah in Isaiah 9.10 that Israel had against the attackers upon them. That same vow of defiance that drove them further away from God and that brought ultimate destruction on their people is the same vow of defiance that has been spoken here in America as a result of the attack of 9.11. And we went through all of that before. We don't have time to go into all the detail of that. But suffice it to say that the same principles and the same uh, prophecies that were at work in ancient Israel are now reactivated in America because of the sequence of events and the manifestation of the harbingers and, and us being founded on God's word just as Israel was founded upon God. We've departed just as Israel departed. Now we're being brought back just as Israel was brought back and we are being defiant against it just as ancient Israel was defiant against the call to return. So the Shemitah then becomes, by default, activated in our culture. It's a sign of national judgment, a nation that has replaced God with its idols. We've done that, right? We've taken money, wealth, and power to replace God being our provider and sustainer. We're our own providers. Yes, God has always intended that, the, that we would get out and work to provide for our house. But knowing that God ultimately is our provider, he's the source of our strength. God is our deliverer. God is our healer. God is our keeper. God is our rock. God is everything to us. But what has happened over time is America has replaced God with everything else that it has around it. It's entertainment. It's pleasure. It's heroes. It's athletes. It's celebrities. All have replaced God in our culture. We've removed God. So we find a warning of pending destruction that would come upon America. And we find it not just in the nine harbingers as we've discussed before, but we find it continuing in the Isaiah 9:10 effect, that it will continue until we repent, until we come back, until we are destroyed, God will continue to call us back. So we see different emblems here of signs of things that we would try to bring uh, to replace God in our culture. But actually what the Shemitah has done in America has brought ultimately a financial crisis to our country. The mystery of Shemitah is being revealed in our country even as we sit. The Wall Street crash that happened at the, both the time of 9-11 and then following years after it would crash again. The ec economic collapse as a result triggered specifically by 9-11, uh, uh, the attack of 9-11. We find Ben Bernanke, the head of, head of the Federal Reserve, attributing the economic collapse directly to uh, to the attack on 9-11, we see Alan Greenspan also attributing the an economic fall that we've had directly to the attack. So everything that happened in the Harbingers, everything that's happened in our calamity is a result of God trying to bring us back. And now the, the Shemitah begins to appear itself, uh, avail itself, the Great Recession. September 2008, the next largest Wall Street crash we've ever had in the history of our country. As we see Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Lehman Brothers all fall. Something that institutions that we thought were as solid as the ground we stand on itself that have been around for hundreds of years begin to shake. So we, in following the sequence of events and why it overlays itself and presents itself as the mystery of the Shemitah in America, let's walk through it. Isaiah 9, 11, 2001, 
I, I keep saying Isaiah. The attack of 9-11, 2001. We see exactly seven years later to the day, to the biblical day, in 2008, the next greatest fall of Wall Street that we've ever seen. Lehman's, Lehman Brothers is allowed to fall. The Federal Reserve, Lehman Brothers didn't just cave. They caved as a result of the attacks of 9-11 and all that went along with the bubbles and the interest rate drops that we studied a couple of weeks ago. That's why Lehman Brothers fell. Lehman Brothers fell because the Federal Reserve made a conscious decision to let it fall. It didn't just fall, but our government leaders actually gathered together and said, are we going to let it fall or not? So there was a decision made whether to give it a bailout or not. I don't know if you remember those days, but as a result of Lehman Brothers failing, 401ks were wiped out. Panic struck through every American that had their retirement funds in any kind of institution that would go up through the Lehman Brothers infrastructure. At that time, there was a huge wiping away of debts, thousands of canceled loans as a result of Lehman Brothers failing. Does that sound familiar? Sounds a little Shemitah-like, doesn't it? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac foreclosures, housing values plummet. And as a result, people short selling their house, loans being wiped away, hundreds of thousands of loans being just wiped away as people walk away from their homes. Sounds Shemitah-like. Because it is. The stock market crash, wiped out gains, Listen to this. Of the previous seven years, at 2008, September of 2008, at the greatest crash this country has ever had in the history of Wall Street, it had wiped out all of the gains that it made over the previous seven years. Seven years, now get that. Seven years of gains. Sounds like ancient Israel and their Shemitah. They would work for six years. On the seventh year, everything wiped away. And it all starts as a clean begins it as a clean slate again. America, the attack on 9-11, 2001, seven years forward, the greatest fall on Wall Street wiped away all gains of the seven years of that period of time. It's pretty amazing. So we have the financial bailouts of 2008. We see those bailouts triggering a stark mo stock market plunge that creates a free fall of more than 700 points. In September of 2008, the greatest stock market crash this country has ever had, which is the seventh year from the attack, the seventh year of Shemitah, it wipes away all of the gains of the previous seven years as the Wall Street Dow drops 700%. Significant because Shemitah is all about the number seven. The Sabbath day is the seventh day of rest. The Shemitah is the seventh year of rest. So we find on the 29th day of biblical Elul, that stock market crash happened to the date when it fell over 700 points, which is the exact day appointed by God for wiping away a nation's financial accounts. It's very stunning. So we're going to give you a little more detail on the significance of the sevens. So the greatest collapse occurred on the crowning day of the seventh year. It triggered when Congress failed to pass the $700 billion financial bailout plan in 2008, in the seventh year, we find 7% of the market being wiped away. 7% of the market in the seventh year of Shemitah as a result of turning down the $700 billion bailout. The Dow Jones fell, get this, not just 700 points, 
it fell 777 points on the seventh year to the day of Shemitah. And this is a graph that I pulled out of the Dow, and it shows in the bold letters down 777. And the thing is, the, what makes this so amazing, it's undeniable proof of the Shemitah, but more importantly, undeniable proof that God is truly in charge of everything that's happening down to every movement of every individual in every country of this planet we live on. Because it literally took everything being perfectly aligned to make this happen. This doesn't just happen. Nobody conspires to make something like this happen. It, but it did happen. And it's because God, his law, and his principles are at work all the time. It's amazing when you look at the, how specific. And we've gone through all the nine harbingers and talked about the... the uh, the walls, of, the, the walls have fallen, we will rebuild with hewn stone, and we see the big gazit stone come into ground zero, and we see the fallen sycamore, and we see the eras tree uh, planted in its place, and we see government leaders begin talking about the ancient vow and all of this, and that's mind-boggling by itself. But when you get into the numbers, and the numbers are this precise, this will turn even the most skeptical of minds, because it's undeniable proof. It is history. And you can't change it. It happened. God is truly at char in charge. The Hebrew definition of the Shemitah is the fall or the letting fall. So it allows the, the clearing of all the debts. Or another interpretation or translation of, of the Shemitah is the letting fall. So it could be referred to as the year of the letting fall. So why that would be important in this context is in September of 2008, and I've already said it, the Federal Reserve chose to let Lehman Brothers fall. They made a conscious choice to allow all those debts to be wiped away, all of those loans to be wiped away, Everything associated with Lehman Brothers, the 401ks, wiped away. You don't see anybody getting repaid by the government for the, for the wiping away of their 401ks, do you? No, they were wiped away. It, it just is what it is. You took the loss, you took the loss. It happened. But it was of a conscious decision of our Federal Reserve to let it fall. It didn't just fall, but somebody voted to let it fall, which is exactly true with the in biblical translation, the Hebrew translation of Shemitah is the letting fall. The letting fall is what literally triggered the global financial collapse. That's when everything just plummeted. That's when the housing bubble just burst, busted, exploded. It was in 2000. We've, everyone, felt the impact of the letting fall. The housing market, the credit market, all of commerce, all financial indicators would reveal there would be a fall. It was the letting fall. It was a Shemitah. So it's really amazing. It is amazing when you look at this. It's amazing to know that God really is concerned with the state of our union. He is very much concerned with what America is doing. And we have wondered as a church for many, many years, how could God just let this go on? How could God let uh, Supreme Court decisions be made that are so vile and against the word of God? How could God allow all of this materialism and all of this wickedness happen in our country and the fact of the matter is God's not just letting it happen but there is a time when God calls a people back and when a people do not come back there is a time that there will be judgment upon the people why because the Bible says the wages of sin is is death 
Now, if God didn't change his mind on that, and say sometimes it's death, or sometimes I'll hold you responsible. Every time, God will hold us responsible and accountable for the decisions and actions that we have and that we make. He will. It may not be immediate, and glad we're not God, right? We probably would have cut people's legs out from underneath them long before this. We probably would have been a lot harsher in our execution of judgment on people that would ignore him and mock him like they do. But God is a, a, a loving God. He will extend his grace and mercy as far as he possibly can to reach some. But there comes a point when we will anger the heart of God. And I believe America is finding herself there right now that we have departed so far and our wickedness is so, so far gone that God has no choice but to call us back to himself. And it's painful. The Shemitah is a blessing, but it also is a judgment if our walk with God is not where it should be. And not just as a nation, but as a person, as an individual, as you and me sitting right here. If we walk with God and we stay true to him, if we pay our tithes, hello, if we pay our tithes like we ought to, if we, ought, if we give God what, what is rightfully his, then he will bless us. We will follow in that, and he will bless the other 90%. I, and somebody I just heard recently say, I would rather have 90% blessed by God than 100% that is cursed by God. Yeah? Oh, come Brother Wilkerson can give me a little tip later for talking about this. We need to pay our tithes, church. It's God's plan. And so we need the blessing of God in every part of our life, not just our finances, our relationships, our careers, our schooling, our education, our health. God needs to be involved. And the only way we get him involved is that we talk to him about it and we submit that part of our life to him. And we say, God, I want you to be Lord of all of my life everything. I want you to be, I, you're engaged. God, I acknowledge you in every part of my life. I don't want to, I don't want to depart from you on any, I don't want any closets, any dark secrets. I want it all to be open before you. And by having it all open before you, I put it all on the altar and I ask you to cover me with your blood, cover my family with your blood, cover my dad with your blood, my mom with your blood, my kids with your blood. Lord, I plead the blood over all my life, over my family, my neighborhood, everywhere that I go, in my car, as I'm driving down the street, cover me with your blood, cover me, let your angels of protection be around me because I am a child of God and I'm submitted to you. You are my God. That's how we do it. That's how we keep that relationship tight and close. Every day we, we have to do that. Otherwise, the very things that are meant to bless us will actually end up bringing judgment upon us. That's the principle of the Shemitah. I know that I know that I know that I'm where I need to be with God. And that's the blessing. That's the peace. But whenever there's a lingering thought that maybe, just maybe, I may not be quite where I need to be, then I need to come to this altar and I need to have a have a heart to heart with God. Every one of us, we all go through that. None of us are exempt. Because Israel once knew God so intimately, you would think a people never could depart like they did, but they did. So who are we to think that we're too high to fall? Any of us. Except for God's grace, there go you and I. We need to every day make sure we're, we're with God where we need to be and following his word. Amen? Amen? Well, look, I misled you. It is, time is up. <laughs> it, is, it is 1045 and I don't have time. Because look, I promise you, look, I had a whole thing of questions here. But guess what? Boom. <laughs> we don't have time to go over the questions. So if you guys will get here early next, or not early, just on time, next, and you got here on time today, I'm not, I'm not getting on you or anything. But uh, maybe we can start with a couple questions next week. So uh, next week's going to be exciting. We're going to talk about the three witnesses. And uh, if you have the books, go ahead and read ahead. But God is so good to us, amen? amen? I'm so glad that we know him and that he knows us. We can call out his name. He's just as close as a mention of his name. God is so good. Let's all stand together and let's worship him for a few minutes. Can we, Jesus? Thank you for today. 
Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for watching over us. God, I thank you that you've reminded us that you are in control. You're a God of precision. You're a God of specifics. You're a God of detail. And it's not just a general notion, but God, you are very concerned with every facet of our life, of our existence, of our being, of our thinking, of our ways, our words. Lord, you know all. You know us better than we know ourselves. And God, I thank you for that today because I can come to you with anything. There's nothing you don't already know. I can be open before you and you can touch me and I can reach out to you and praise you and make my heart a habitation for your presence. God, I pray today that this sanctuary would be filled with your presence again. Lord, as we worship you, as we lift you up, for we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we praise you today. We glorify you today. We exalt you. Lord, we extol thee today. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Almighty God. We praise you today. In Jesus' name we pray. God is so good. Let's shake hands with one another. We're going to go into the worship service in just a few minutes and hear some good preaching a little later. God bless you.